Welcome to The Definitive Rap, where we report the truth about American exceptionalism. We love our flag, we love our country, and we believe in America. The Definitive Rap, where we respect people of faith, the men and women in blue, and our support for Israel. And now, your host, Bela Zebra, on The Definitive Rap. Hello, and welcome to The Definitive Rap. I am Bela Seabrow. There are few true heroes in our midst, people who stick their necks out to help others, who do it not for money or fame, but because they truly care to help those whom nobody cares about. And those are the unsung heroes. Here on The Definitive Rap, we bring the truth to the forefront. We respect people of all faiths, and we believe in America and justice for all. Our guest today, Mark Appel, lives and breathes for peace and justice. Mark Appel, a longtime advocate, has dedicated his life to advancing civil rights for all Americans and bridging the divide between different communities. He founded the Bridge Multicultural and Advocacy Project that is a unity center that aims to address issues across cultural lines and advocates for transformational change in New York's diverse com communities. Mark unites people of every racial, ethnic, cultural, and religious background. Mark has also spent 10 years rallying the support for the bill called the Passage of the Child Victims Act, a great victory for all victims of sex abuse. Mark, welcome to the definitive rap. I am in awe of what you do. Please tell us about your background. How did you become, how did you become the great Mark Appel doing what you do for so many years? Oh, it's, it's with you. First of all, thank you for having me on the show. I'm very humbled and blessed to have the ability that Rabbi Shalom gave me the koyach, gave me the energy to do what I'm doing. It's amazing because as a youngster, I was pretty much a very shy individual. I'm still a very shy individual. When it comes to something I believe in, the passion breaks out and I go crazy. I go really, really. So, you know, I grew up to a very religious family uh, from Munkach, very rabbinical family. I went to yeshiva, normal yeshivas. And then later in my life, I was involved in community not for profits in Borough Park and in Flatbush and, and, and locally and nationally. Then I started a school for special ed children. Oh. Um, in 1986, Congress passed a law saying that uh, early intervention for infants uh, become an entitlement, which means that millions of from children that suffer from autism, we have a high rate of autism in the Orthodox community. Right. We'll now be able to get much more services that are going to be available because it's a federal entitlement and the federal government will pay 50% of the monies. Anyways, the Congress passes the law in 1986 and they give the states, every state of, of America had five years to establish a lead agency. So it's five years down the road, I'm running a program already with difficulties getting the money through a different system without federal reimbursement. What was the name it's of that program? Years. I'm sorry, what was the name yeah, of that program? The early intervention program. But prior to that, it was called the family court program. Okay. I had to go to court for each child. So that was a kind of difficult process and it limited the access from people to get, to get the services. Anyway, it's five years down the road and the state of New York, they're nowhere to be found. They haven't implemented a program. And the front people were agitated. The parents were agitated. I got calls from so many parents. They wanted, to, and so I said, you know what? It's not a from issue. This is a general issue, issue right. affecting all people, not only from people, but black people that suffer high rates of uh, infant mortality and stuff like that. Yeah. So I reached out to a uh, one of my assembly people. They hooked me up. They connected me. But Assemblyman Steve Sanders at that time, he was the Assemblyman. He was the chair of the Education Committee, and he held public hearings throughout the state on the implementation of the program. And I, I reached out to him. I testified before the, before the State Assembly, and I brought in a lot of Black leaders. We came along with Mother Hale, who at that time was a worldwide celebrity. She came in. I still have the testimony and the photos. And we got the program done. We got the program done. I sat July 4th in my house 
in my house, July 4th, 1992, and I actually typed the bill in my house on a manual typewriter, and I was able to get it with some questions about the budget. I, I put in the sunset clause. Steve Sanders today is the chairman of a school in, in our neighborhood where we live, in Cedarhurst. Uh, he retired from the New York State Assembly, and he's the chairman. A lot of my friends, a lot of your friends, work for Steve Sanders, so that's the small thing. Anyways, I realized at that time, this was in 1993, that any one person could change the world. Yeah. You don't have to be sitting back and criticizing government. We know the government messes up a lot of things and doesn't do things efficiently. We as an individual, one person can change the world. That's right. And I changed that with the special education. Then I lived in, you know, following the opening of the school, I had a school for about 20 years. I moved to the city. I had a large brownstone in the city. And for some reason, every Thursday night, the children that they call OTD, I don't call them OTD, but it's been labeled as OTD, Wind well, up just my for house, our and, audience, excuse me, just yeah, for our audience say, who doesn't know what OTD stands for, it stands for off the derech. Off the off derech, the which path. means they're a little, little bit, they're not in line with their uh, with their family as far as uh, religion, as ideology, or the way of life. Anyways, they would come to my house, I'd serve them food, um, oh. we, I, we'd watch television, we'd watch movies, we'd go to trips, we'd do things together. And I realized... One by one, these boys were coming from the most prominent families in Williamsburg, Borough Park, Five Towns, telling me about how they were abused. So I said to myself, you know what? I had a big mouth before. Let me <laughs> open my mouth. Right. And I went to work. I went to Albany every year for 10 years, starting in 2000. I believe it was 2013 or 2014 was my first press conference with Assemblyman Marge Markey. The Hiking was there. Other assembly people were there. This was a battle, like no battles that haven't been in New York State. What type of abuse were um, these children reporting? Some of them were abused by family members, some of, some, and a lot of them were abused in the, in the yeshiva. The yeshiva that's created to protect our children wasn't wasn't responding to complaints about abused children. Abused how? Some, Emotionally? How were they abused? Oh, they were abused physically, sexually. sexually. By, by, and there was one rabbi... Uh, he's not a rabbi anymore. He's working for the Satmar community. And I must admit, he has the best reputation in the whole world, the best reputation in the world. And I defended, the, 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 somebody accused him, I defended the, uh, I, I supported the victim, I believed him. But I tell you the truth, I wasn't 100% sure. Last year, a friend of mine, who's a close friend of mine for 10 years, sat in my living room right here in Woodman, New York, and told me that his brother was abused by the same person. Oh, my gosh. So what did the Satmar community do? They fired the rabbi so they couldn't be sued, right? They fired oh, the rabbi. Okay. And when the guy, the victim, reached 21 years old, the statute of limitations were up. They rehired the rabbi. They oh rehired him. It's, it's insane. It's insane what was going on. I was fighting a battle with the Catholic Church because they have a lot of abuse in the Catholic Church. I was fighting with Aguda. I was fighting with Torah Masora. I was fighting with Ohel. I sort of became a pariah. Pariah means that they looked at me like I'm a rat, I'm a musser. Oh, yeah, that's, because, uh, yeah. Because yeah, that's the way it is. They, yeah. had, they had a rationale. They had a, yeah. they had a reasoning. The reasoning was that the yeshiva board of directors Something that happened 30 years ago, they shouldn't be responsible for it. You know, it's a new board of directors, you know. But uh, I'm saying to you on, on this live pod podcast that there were some assemblymen that approached me and introduced a bill and took out the yeshiva part, took out that dangerous part. But one prominent rabbi, the head of one of the national and most prominent religious groups, called him up and said, I want that out too. So we fought for 10 years. We went to Albany, we went to, we, we lobbied. And I, I used the same system that I used with the early intervention law. I used the same system. I found out that my assembly person, 
head of the Brooklyn Democratic Party, Radice Bichette, and other four black assembly women were also sexually assaulted, not in yeshiva, but by a friend, by a cousin, or right. school. I brought them into the, and once we brought them in, this law was passed after 10 years. It was passed in Albany like four years ago, uh, 100% in the Senate and 98% in the Assembly. I stood there in the Senate, in the Assembly, inside the chamber. I raised my hand with Radis Bichette and Assemblywoman Rosenthal, and it was, it was a great victory. But don't forget, this is only this, this look back window where you could sue your Rebbe or you could sue your minister or your priest going back 30 years, was only made for one year. So now it's it's it was extended one year because of the COVID virus. But right. And now, you know, I, I started getting calls in the last couple of weeks. Are they going to reintroduce the bill? And I told the guy on the phone, he's a leading advocate, I said, which rabbi told you to call me? Uh, I hope, Be'ezrat Hashem, that this law will become permanent and that you can sue. Uh, no yeshivas are going to go bankrupt. Shivas are doing the right thing right today. All the schools are teaching. They have curriculums from Magenu, other organizations, and we're doing well. That's the good news is that from all this advocacy, from all this hard work, there is good things that have been done. Yeshivas and mm -hmm. parents are much more aware of this topic. Right, right. it raises and, awareness and it also right, normalizes right. it for the victim because victims right, right. tend to think they're the only one. So why is there so much cover-up in the Orthodox community with regards to sexual abuse and rape? You know, other communities, well, other faiths have understand. no problem with it. I mean, not I'm, in terms of reporting or talking about it, but why is it so hushed up in the Orthodox community? I, I, it's I, a crime. I, it's a crime like any other crime, like 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 being, it's, it's an assault. A sexual assault is an assault. So why is sexual abuse hushed up, but if somebody gets, God forbid, shot or stabbed, that's not hushed up. It's a, it's a serious problem, not only here, but even in Israel. You had a, a minister of a, a minister in the government, cabinet member of the government of the state of Israel, um, I forgot his name, uh, and who was covering up the uh, Lisman, Lisman who, who had to resign now and he pleaded guilty. Him and the, he's a part of the Ger community. Whether the Ger Rebbe was involved, I don't know. I can't say that. You know, I can't talk against the Godel. But I will say that he covered up Mondrowitz. He covered up that woman in Australia. Uh, I mean, there's no words to be said. I mean, Mondrowitz was a psychologist in Borough Park, and I knew him. He was a neighbor of mine. This guy assaulted. Thousands of kids, including many, many Italian kids. He lived on 60th Street, just 15th Avenue. And he walks around in Israel like, 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 like with, with, a, with a Shabbos. He walks around with a Strymel, a Spudik, yeah. Yeah. and a big silver thing on his talus. I've seen him in Israel. I mean, he's gotten attacked a couple of times. But how could you have a member of the Israeli government, Lisbon, cover up this case? And they finally caught up to him and he had to resign from the government and plead guilty. Uh, for covering up, but I don't understand New York City. In case anybody's listening, if you have a problem with sexual abuse, either you call me or you call the police or you call the DA. Do not call your rabbi. A rabbi, you have to call when you're ready. When you want to know what to do with a pot of pesach to kosher. When you when you want to buy real estate, you go to a real estate broker. When you have a problem with a crime, don't go to a rabbi. With all due respect, go to a district attorney and go. And go speak up, and don't don't let don't let go. Because if you let go, other children will be affected as well. So, is it true that one of the reasons they let it go and they don't talk about it is because they're afraid of retaliation? Meaning, the victims are afraid of retaliation. Is there? Isn't it true that there is retaliation in communities um, course, against the victims who speak out That's against true. sexual abuse, especially against the person of power? Especially in the Hasidic community, all these families that reported the crimes, including the crimes against women, they had to move out of the neighborhood, right. their boilers were broken, their electric was cut off, the kids were kicked out of yeshiva. Yeah. Ridiculous. I mean, it's ridiculous, you know. So what what can you say to victims of, of abuse? Because, yes, they could report it. You're, you're encouraging them to report it, and they should report it. Sexual abuse needs I'm, to be I'm not stopped. So worried. These I'm not, people I'm not need to be so put away. About... But what can they do so that they can 
remain in the community that they're culturally connected to? There's ways that, you know, they can go to, they can call me or they can, they can go to a psychologist and have the psychologist report the abuse because a psychologist is a professional and they can always say that it was reported by a psychologist. Even the famous Weberman case, everybody right. said the woman made up the story. Right. She never went to the police. Right. She was suffering for 10 years. Yes. Thank God she has two children today, but she was suffering for 10 years. It was a psychologist in a modern school, a Sora with her eyes closed in school and reported the thing to, and she finally admitted it after, after them pulling out the information from her. But don't give up, don't give up. If you, if you, if you don't, and, and you want to some, this is not limited to a very religious Hasidic or, or religious yeshiva. It's, it's, you know, Yeshiva University, other uh, yeah. modern schools have, have lawsuits pending for millions and millions of dollars, you know, that, that I'm involved with the case. I can't talk about the case too much. But there's one guy who worked at Yeshiva University. They kicked him out. He went Why to did work they kick in Florida. They kicked him out because he was inappropriate with kids. And he, he got a job working as principal of a school in Florida. Why the hell they didn't tell the school in Florida not to hire him? The school in Florida hire, fires him. The guy's wife calls me up and says, Why did they fire my husband? She was suspicious. He moves to Israel and gets a job in a major institution. <laughs> I mean, so not only do we have a personal responsibility, but there's an institutional responsibility. Right. If an institution knows that they fired somebody because they're inappropriate, it's their responsibility to reach out to any potential hire, to potential employee, and let them know, listen, we can't be 100%, but be on the lookout. I mean, I had a case in Florida. This guy was totally crazy. He, there were three victims against him. Torah Masora gives out a letter to him. And Torah Masora is a holy organization. They do a lot of beautiful work. I'm not knocking the work that they do. They give a letter saying that this guy is a tzaddik and this guy didn't commit any crimes. They never even saw him. They never spoke to him. This guy tried to sue me in court. So we subpoenaed Torah Masora. We subpoenaed every rabbi that signed that letter. In other words, Five the perpetrator, the perpetrator sued you. Right, right. So five to twelve midnight, a day before the the the, 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 the statute of limitation ended, Torah Masora withdrew their lawsuit against me, against us, and they had to pay. They had to pay legal fees. Mm. I mean, Torah Masora is a holy organization. Yeah. He just passed away. Uh, the, the esteemed leader, Rabbi Fishman, who was a Holy man, the rabbi of Shul, of Shalom in Broadway Street. I don't know. I don't know why they have the framework that cover up is the right thing to do. It's the wrong thing to do. But but there are no good things that are happening, and and today yeshivas are flourishing with this in our community. Rabbi Bender's yeshiva and all the all shuls in the neighborhood. Everybody's aware. I know in my show, this shop is, you know, instead of taking the candies and giving it out to the kids, it, which is, you know, I did it by, myself once and somebody said, you shouldn't be doing that, right? <laughs> but I saw Robert Bloomstein's show, I saw they put the candies on a bucket in the middle of the table and a certain time after the Kriya Satoru, everybody would reach out and take the candies, right? right. <laughs> this way, there's no candy man, no, right. <laughs> no question, you know. Yeah. That was nice, you know. Yeah, I just noticed that this best job is here. Yeah. Mark, when I said earlier that I'm in awe of what you do, anyone who has ever attended the Hanukkah party at the Bridge Multicultural and Advocacy Center is in awe, too, of you. Watching how people of different faiths celebrate and eat together, socializing, it's such a beautiful sight. And I'm always grateful to be invited to attend such events. Thank you. I, I thank you so much for including me. My question, Mark, is um, what motivated you to address the challenge of bringing multicultural communities and people together to form the Bridge Project? Well, you know, first of all, I realized that I have some kind of iconic ability to, to do advocacy work and get it done. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, sort of, <laughs> you've made you that know, very clear throughout I, your wait, life. Wait, I'm saying that I'm saying that with, with uh, humility and trying not to. But I had a, a kind of that. I also had a strength that I was very, I'm very close to uh, uh, all the major uh, minority elected officials, black officials, 
um, very, very close to them. I, I, I bought the whole Brooklyn delegation, the judges, the head of the county. I bought them to actually to five towns or for a, for a barbecue less two years ago. Oh, wow. And uh, I was getting some calls, you know. <laughs> but anyways, my parents were Hasidic people. You know, not ultra Hasidic, but Hasidic people come from a very Bobatish home. Yeah. And my mother always, my mother and my father, when it came to uh, uh, dealing with diversity, they were very liberal about it, you know? Very liberal about it because my mother said she was in Auschwitz for two years. Two years she was there in Auschwitz, starving. After two years, the Russians came and freed in 1943, 44. Right. They freed Russia, the, I mean, Auschwitz. Right. And then the Americans came in and started, set up the DP camps. Yes. And they were the ones that gave my mother the first cup of soup. Mm -hmm. My mother looked up to, my mother couldn't even open her eyes, barely open her eyes. She and my aunt, Sarah Michelle, may she rest in peace. My uncle was Rabbi Michelle from Rockland County. Um, she opened her eyes and she looked at these troops. These troops traveled 6,000 miles away. They were hungry, tired. She looked up at their faces and what did she see? First black person in her life. Mm -hmm. The first Asian in her life. Mm -hmm. The first Spanish person yes. in her life. How can we live in a community, whether it's in Five Towns, Borough Park, or anywhere, and have any hate towards other communities that fought for our freedom, that brought us food, that brought us to America, that funded highest, put us yes. in the department, yes. helped build Jewish education and Jewish in, in America? How could we have hate? So I started this organization called The Bridge. 10 years ago, it was our 10th anniversary now, you were there. And uh, it was just amazing that when we have events, whether they're a blood drive, uh, we have uh, Haitian Day, Haitian Flag Day. Um, next week, Tuesday, we're having forum costumes distribution with the Jewish family, with the Jewish Flatbush Foundation. We do Jewish things. Every event that we do is attended by Muslims, Jews, and Blacks. Mm. So this way, it's, you know, we have much more, we, we share much more with the black community and on, on most issues that we disagree. And we have to work. We have to work with, if we don't work with our adjoining communities, with our adjoining cultures, then we, we're only, we're less than 20 million people in America, in the Jews in the world. You know, what influence do we have? Bring them in. Bring them in. They will support us. 80% of of, 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 of black community support more policing and safety in the street, support charter schools, support education, support initiatives that are important. I know in our community in Long Island, the Far Rockaway Jewish Community Council, um, it was run by Marsha, by Marsha Bransdorf, he's not there anymore, but they do a superb job in dealing with its uh, integrated community, you know, most diverse community. They do an amazing job. And like two years ago, they had the Black Lives Matter protest. Yeah. And there are some questions, I, I admit. I'll be the first one to admit there's some questions. If Black Lives Matter has done some damage in America, done some crazy things in Manhattan, graffiti and stuff like that. But the, the community of the, the Jewish community of Far Rockaway, Moshe Brezdo, for all yeshiva people, said it's appropriate that we have to support the Black community of what happened police violence against you. So I went. So I, I hope the Lord I saw you marching. Well, I saw. <laughs> I, I saw. Yeah. I hope the people in the five towns also realize that we're not living in the in the, in the vacuum, you know, that there's other people in the world, you know. So right. it's exciting to be part of the bridge. I mean, sometimes we honor people that we honored at the holiday party. We honored uh, Nelson Mandela's grandson. And so people call me and said, well, he's made statements about Israel. I says, <laughs> that's why we're honoring him. We're honoring him so I can. He, he got an airfall for me. Believe me, if he wants to be the president of South Africa, he's going to shut up about it and start changing his views. People have changed their views. You can't do it with hate. Of course. You can't do it with Zoom. You can't do it with Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, whatever it is. You can't do it. You can only convince people with love. You have a fight with your husband, with your boyfriend, with your son, with your child. You tell them, listen, if you 
I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm gonna punish you. I'm not, I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk away. It's not, it never helps. Yeah. Love them, talk to them, and people. Most of us are open to change. Most of, most of people yeah. are open to change. People who want, so people can, who want yeah. peace are open to change. We have to, we have to work with the communities and mm -hmm. the black community. I, I speak to the progressive, the very progressive every day. Um, Last week I went to a, uh, it was an interesting thing sponsored by uh, Council Mechaim Deutsch uh, originally that the children in public schools, there are a lot of Jewish children in public schools, don't get kosher food. But so the Muslims made a big issue, they don't get halal food. So I said, so I bought in the kosher food. I said, you know, I, and I went to City Hall, the mayor was there, and we had a press conference, and I said, it's amazing. Somebody went, it goes to jail. Right away, uh, you get kosher food, right? right? But if you go to public school, <laughs> you have to beg for it, you know? <laughs> so those are the things that even with Muslims, you can work together. Right. So that, right. Me, the Mark, people. as all leaders throughout history have experienced pushback from people who are either jealous or feel threatened, what has been your biggest challenge? The biggest challenge is dealing with, uh, you know, uh, local issues that people disagree on, you know, disagree on. You know, there's a lot of issues in Israel right now. But on my Facebook page and on my website, I don't I don't involve myself in the discussion publicly. I'll do it privately, but about Israel. You know, when I deal with my Muslim friends, Israel is off, off the table. I had some Muslim friends that came with me to Israel, by the way, oh. three, in 2018. I took them to Israel mm -hmm. and... So I have a very good, excellent relationship with the Muslim community. But I know there are things that we disagree on. But don't forget, they don't know anything about Israel. They don't even know where Israel is situated. Right. They don't know that Israel is a democracy. And Israel is a more democratic country. You know, try to have a gay pride uh, march on Central Avenue. <laughs> right? You would that would never would that happen? It would never, oh, no, it would, it would, it would never it happen. Happens, it happens in the holy city of Jerusalem. So we're talking. You have a government where you have eight percent of the, the members of the parliament are Muslims, right? Right. Do we have eight percent in America? Never. We have a couple of nut jobs, but not eight percent. You know. <laughs> uh, so we have to move forward. We have to keep building relationships. I hope my friends in Five Towns and other communities. Build relationships with the joining communities. Doesn't mean that everything is perfect. Doesn't mean everything is perfect. But you have to deal with it. The Holy Menchus of Loza used to meet the, the king of uh, Czechoslovakia. Everybody knows that, you know. Um, rabbinic leaders over hundreds of years are always uh, uh, saying a bracha, just like we say a bracha for Medina to Israel, saying a bracha for the government. We have to work with them. Even even if we have to disagree with them on, on some of the issues, but we have to we have to stay strong. We have to be proud Jews, and 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 work forward to building a a, a future generation of of strength through love. So hate will never work. Hate will never work. How can people get more involved with your project, and how can they get in touch with you? Well, well first of all, I have a beautiful website. Uh, you can go on it. It's the bridge. MCP, Mother Cat Peter, the bridge mcp.org. We're also listed. You can call me, call me myself, which is 917-804-3942, 917-804-3942. And you can also call us. We've established we're, uh, uh, the first uh, television network. And we hope, Bella, you come on as one of our hosts. But we have, we're launching our own television station that will be broadcasting throughout the city and as a matter of fact throughout the world through Roku, through Brick TV, through Amazon, through Manhattan Cable, Brooklyn Cable. It's going to be a live show. It's going to be on twice a month starting April. Uh, and we're looking forward to covering emerging communities. Emerging communities mean uh, new kosher restaurants, new special ed schools, nonprofit organizations, organizations like Achieza, Atzola, Tawheshabas, all these wonderful organizations we're going to be focusing. And we'll be live twice a month in the beginning. And then we're going to extend it to weekly show, uh, hopefully by next spring. So looking forward to it. And please go on the website uh, again, 
to bridgemcp.org and enjoy. And you can always contact me through the website. I always call back. So thank you, Bela, so much for having me. Of course. You look great. Of course. You look great. And uh, you look, you're a good host. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad that we have somebody that's open to discussion. Sometimes things are so not, not so comfortable. But somehow you have a way with your charm to make uncomfortable situations into Thank comfortable you. situations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mark, God bless you for all that you do for his children. May you live a long, healthy, and successful life. Thank very, you for I'm joining very, us today. Thank you. Thank you to Vin News and to our audience for tuning in. Thanks for listening to The Definitive Wrap with your host, Bela Seabrow. Be sure to tell your family and friends they also can catch The Definitive Wrap on Apple Music, Spotify, Google Play, and your favorite streaming service. See you next time on The Definitive Wrap.